G'day, and welcome to the Life Aquatic with Rob Bull. Hey YouTube, in today's episode we'll be taking an in-depth look at these little guys, diatoms, also known as brown spot algae, or by the far more flattering name, jewels of the sea. We'll be taking a squeeze at what it is, what it does, and how to manage it. Along the way we'll also dispel a few myths that I found whilst researching diatoms on the net. And this video will also feature my on-screen YouTube debut, as I deal with the diatoms in the tank that inspired this video. As you guys will be able to tell, I clearly dressed up for the occasion. To be perfectly honest, I was going for the homeless look. A highly underrated look, in my opinion. But until we get there, the footage you guys are seeing is of the troublesome tank in question. So, I guess I should get the obligatory self-promotion out of the way. If you guys do find this video helpful or informative, or by some remarkable chance actually entertaining, don't forget to gently click that like button, share it, and of course subscribe, and ring the little bell next to the subscribe button, so that you don't miss any of this riveting and highly entertaining aquarium-related content. So, what are diatoms? Well, they're a major group of algae that can basically be found anywhere you can find water, including damp soil. These little fellas are pretty important, as they produce about 20% of the oxygen that's produced on the Earth each year. So, when you think about it, these magnificent brown dots are responsible for one in every five breaths of life-saving oxygen you take. Now there's two things that separate diatoms from other kinds of algae. The first is that they have a urea cycle, and the second, and the one that is really important for control, is that they manufacture their cell walls from silica. Now this doesn't become apparent until you magnify the image of the diatom under a microscope, which we'll see here, and you can also see here where it gets its brown colour, the yellowish liquid within the cell, which is actually the chlorophyll, which the diatoms use to perform photosynthesis. And honestly guys, that one's a tongue twister. Try saying that one three times fast. But anyway, back to it. Uh, so as you can see there, in the image, their cell walls are essentially glass, and they have little slits in it to let nutrients in and to expel waste. And so it comes time to address what they're not. Now in various places on the internet, including YouTube, I've seen it said that they will steal the oxygen out of the water. And whilst it's true that diatoms, like every other living organism on the planet, require oxygen to survive, in an ecosystem, diatoms perform the same role as plants, and they're no more dangerous to have in your aquarium than plants. The other myth I've seen going around is that they're poisonous, and will somehow magically poison your water. That quite simply isn't true. Many fish will eat diatoms, I mean, if they die in your tank and decompose, they might cause an ammonia spike, but they themselves are not poisonous. Now, at this point, I can envision people around the world saying, Rob, I'm here because I've got the stuff and I don't want to have it anymore, so we better get into controlling it. So, for those of you out there who like to use chemicals to control your algae outbreaks, I've got some bad news for you. I wasn't able to find any information on the net about chemical controls for brown spot algae. Fortunately, however, there are a couple of ways that we can deal with it that aren't too difficult at all. But remember that we have to keep in mind, as with all algae, if we don't address the causes, it will just come back. So, what causes diatom blooms? The answer is the same stuff that causes blooms of other algae. So, excessive nutrients and excessive light. Most common place to see this algae is in a newly set up aquarium and the diatoms will generally disappear and be replaced with green algae once they've exhausted the silica in the water column. The reason for this is that the diatoms outcompete the algae and plants when there's sufficient silica in the water because it requires about 8% less energy to manufacture a cell wall out of silica. Now, if you have a substrate that is rich in silica, as I do, you may find yourself with this problem in an established aquarium. This one here has been running for three years in total. Another source of silicates can be found if you're using a diatom filter. So apart from reducing the causes, what can we do to get rid of it? Well, to be honest with you, there's only really two options. We can wipe it off 
and fortunately diatoms are remarkably easy to wipe off glass and decorations. And the only other real option is what I like to call animal control. No, not the city department, but rather using algae eating invertebrates such as shrimp, snails, or fish like Placostomus and Odocinglus species to control it. And speaking from experience, if you can squeeze a bristle nose in there, you should do the job just nicely. Just check out the difference between these two tanks. Both have the same substrate, the three foot has a bristle nose in it, the four foot doesn't. Now, how I'm going to deal with it is first by wiping it off and by reducing the nutrient levels and cutting back the lighting by about two hours a day. The guys in the Thunderdome have been getting a little bit of extra food lately as I've been recording an episode on how to train your fish. The reason that the diatoms are even concerning me at all is because of the java moss that I'm trying to get to grow in there, which the diatoms are quite simply out-competing. So if this doesn't work and the moss continues to struggle, I will most likely have to introduce a bristle nose to that tank, maybe two. But I'm kind of loath to do that because there are shrimp living in that tank and I don't want to take away their food source. And here's me starting to get to work on the Thunderdome before first realising that I've forgotten to take off the cover glass and then forgetting that I haven't washed my hands and arms yet. And that right there, folks, is some professional level forgetting. Now, as you guys can hopefully see, I'm using a simple non-scratch scourer and I can safely say that it won't scratch your glass. However, I did soak this one for about four days just in case they try and sneak any antibacterial stuff into it. I couldn't find it on the label, but when I opened it, it was a little bit moist, which made me a bit sus. A couple of other things that I'd like to point out about this method. First, you should always try and wipe up and squeeze the scourer out into a bucket of water so that you actually remove as many diatoms as possible in your aquarium ecosystem. And the other thing is to be careful not to pick up any grains of sand or small pebbles with the sponge. They most definitely will scratch your glass. And as you can see here, the fish aren't overly bothered by me having my arms in the tank. In fact, many times while I was making this video, they were pecking at my arms and generally hanging around expecting to get some food. So my hope here is that by cleaning all this off the glass and removing it from the aquarium, that there will be enough nutrients around for the java moss to get a nice strong foothold in the thunderdome. Now another step that I could take would be to remove the silica rich sand which would leave the moss regular green algae with which it has a level playing field. It's obviously the green algae doesn't have the advantage of making its cell walls out of what is essentially glass. However in my case this isn't going to work because that is a massive job and this little black duck is way too lazy for that business. In addition to that, you might notice the really deep substrate, which is there as I'm experimenting with the anaerobic bacteria method, but that one is the subject of another video. And one last tip, don't use a razor or a spatula on this. I've used both of those on green film algae before, and they will work on this as well. However, diatoms are so easy to remove with this scour that it is just way more time efficient. Now, for you brave and hardy souls who've managed to make it through nine minutes of me rambling on about magnificent brown dots, I have a fish-related joke for you as a reward or, alternatively, as a punishment. So, here goes. How do fish get high? Ah, uh, gee, we're all to know. How do fish get high? On seaweed. <laughs> I'm here all week. <laughs> Try the video. Anyway, fish folk, thanks for watching and supporting the channel. It inspires me to continue making informative content for you guys. And of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Psst, ring the bell too. And as usual, until next time, look after each other and your fish.